Right. Uh, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here today, today to talk to you about um, what offsite can do for us, uh, this approach to construction, and, and particularly in the realm of delivering modern, high quality learning environments. So, modernize or die. In 2016, Mark Farmer was commissioned by the UK government to do a written branch review of our construction industry, how we designed, procured, fabricated, and constructed everything that we did in the UK and to assess it and see what was good and what was bad. And what he found was that on pretty much every single metric that he looked at, we, not surprisingly to many of us who have been in this industry a long time, we scored pretty badly. We had low productivity, low predictability, and all of these things were symptoma symptomatic of a lack of R&D investment, lack of innovation within the industry. We had a shrinking workforce, and possibly most concerning of all was the fact that we were entirely failing to be able to attract the talent that we needed as an industry to keep up with, with many other different industry sectors. Um, and so what Mark proposed is that um, one of the mechanisms that we could most effectively implement that would allow us to address all of these shortfallings was to um, improve our access and capabilities in the world of, of off-site construction. This would allow us to improve quality, reduce waste, and most importantly, allow us to implement the modern technologies that were being uh, developed around the world. Now, when he selected his title for this document, I, I expect Mark was just using a little personification to add a bit of impact to the, to the document. But in 2019, all around the world, hundreds, thousands of people in, in towns and cities were, were railing up, um, very unhappy at the fact that they were seeing inactivity on the part of their politicians in the face of the, the climate emergency, the undeniable fact that, that climate change was affecting our world, and that literally we were now, if without change, in, 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 the, in the in immediate danger of our lives being affected. Um, our, our, our politicians did actually respond to this, and the UK government then went and thought, we will leak from the front, and unilaterally declared that we would be carbon neutral as a country by 2050. They did that and then they thought, oh, what does that actually mean? How are we going to deliver this? And so having made the announcement, they came back, assembled um, a, a team of um, academics from Cambridge, Imperial College, Oxford, to say, what does this actually mean for us? How will we achieve absolute zero by uh, 2050 and they produced this incredible piece of work called absolute zero which if you haven't read i thoroughly recommend that you do because what is contained in this document is lays bare the stack realities of what we are going to have to achieve and if we look at just a couple of the um, elements that affect us within the construction uh, sector this document tells us that with no alternatives that don't burn fossil fuels to flying or shipping, all flying, all shipping, and all freight related to that is going to have to significantly decline over 10 years and come to an end by 2050. When we look at construction and manufacturing, it lays bare the fact that we must be able to do much, much more with less and that with whatever we do generate, we must do it in a, in a CO2 efficient mechanism as we can possibly do. So it's clear from this documentation that we have to adopt practices that um, offsite uh, embodies. We, John Ruskin said when we build, let it not be for present delights, not for present use, let it be such work as our descendants will, will thank us for. And there is a real danger that in the, the, the crushing, um, uh, the crushing uh, drive to get climate change under control, that the importance of the design gets marginalized. But we must not lose sight of the long-term game. We must not reduce quality. We must build in durability, adaptability, 
And we must include passionate, talented people in everything that we do as we move these agendas forward. For us at AKT, we've spent 25 years working relentlessly to produce buildings that um, put design and the belief that design can add to any given um, situation at the heart of everything we do. When we set out our, our business, we set out with the simple tenet that we would challenge the status quo in everything. It is a simple tenet, and in principle, it's quite easy, but actually it requires an enormous amount of hard work. And so across the years, we have worked tirelessly to engage with academic institutions, ensuring that we stay connected to leading edge research, and at the same time, interfacing with the institutions that our construction industry are influenced and who eventually will lead their, um, the, 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 the subcontractors who are their members through this path of, of enlight, enlightenment that technology can bring to us. Um, this is particularly important to us because in everything that we do, in every project that we approach, we operate in an area that we like to call the compromise zone. There's a constant fight between complexity, value and efficiency. And to be able to benefit as we move forward and to do more with less, we need to be able to expand on that. We need to be able to amplify this, this zone. And this can only really be achieved by clever um, attachment of technology by using digital design, modern fabrication processes, and allowing and enabling an access to a wide net of, 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 of SMEs who are passionate about what they do and facilitating knowledge share in everything that we learn as we go through this process. So for us, it is no longer enough to simply be a structural engineer. Um, what we need is a collective skill set which includes scripting, access to material size, parametric design, data management, enable, to enable us to contribute to the discussions and make sure that we push the, the technologies which will respond to this climate uh, change forward. Simply put, we have to change attitudes. Innovation is very seldom a eureka moment, but rather it's an assimilation of many small steps which has come from hard work, constant questioning of what could be done better, you know, embracing the fact that setbacks and failures should, should bring inspiration rather than dejection. Um, but of course, offsite is not new. We, we have tried it many times in the past. Um, and it has failed many times in the past. It's been affected by social, political, and economic uh, cycles. And of course, it clearly has an image problem that has to be overcome. Expectations of monotonous, poor design, and efficiency at the cost of quality and sensual, sensual, sensual experience has plagued this form of construction. It has not succeeded historically. So what are we going to do? How are we going to change that and, and succeed? Um, I find it quite interesting that whenever anyone draws a, a comparator to our industry, they hold up the automotive industry as, as the most relevant metaphor, which I don't think it is actually. I think this is a, a product which is acontextual. It's built around a repetitive chassis and everything that they do is about front end investment, which drives a sales outcome. It's an industry that's dominated by a few big global entities who basically set out to actively crush competition and destroy creative dialogue. For me then, fashion is perhaps a better metaphor. Like all of the sites that we find within our towns and cities, it is wholly contextual. It is influenced by tradition, by culture, by materiality. The chassis around which we, we construct is always different. And perhaps most of most fundamental importance, this industry has always remained accessible to SMEs who can drive change. And we have to be clear about this. If we allow what is happening, the, the, the sort of um, the world of offsite that is now being generated by technology advancements to become dominated by a few global players, 
it will never achieve its full potential. It will be strangled, shackled. For it to succeed, simply put, it must be accessible to all. It must be usable by all. Um, many people, uh, when you talk about off-site construction, automatically think of volumetric. Reason for that is it's got an enormous amount of airplay at the moment due to the fact that we have a pretty significant crisis or shortfall in supply within our, our housing uh, sector, and many are holding volumetric up as a, a bit of a panacea to the problem, which I don't believe it is. But offsite construction is very much more than that, and it can go everything from panelized construction, such as um, precast concrete, CLT panels, to framed elements which are then fundamentally decorated with, um, with, with panelized systems that attach to. Each of these systems um, has its own set of challenge, challenges in terms of supply chain availability, finance and program, the effect on, on when and how we design um, and scale and procurement. Uh, but volumetric has, has really been quite limited by, by the fact that it cannot accommodate great differences in design. Um, this is beginning to change a little bit. There are a few good um, examples out there, such as, as this project, which was designed for Urban Splash by Shed KM, which has built a, a, a structural chassis within which the building can completely be redesigned and refocused, allowing it to contextualize a, a little bit more. In central London, we find that the, the uh, panelized systems will give us access to much greater supply chain spread and, and be able to deliver at um, a higher density than would be achievable through most other systems. But it is when we really start to look at prefabrication material systems and dig down into the granularity of, of what is available to us that the opportunity really begins to unlock. When we look at these matrix, this palette of materials that we could utilize, and if we can link them using digital technologies, then we can open up almost an endless amount of opportunities for us. And this is really where the exciting end of the industry is. Digital has been absolutely critical in driving this forward. Nowadays, we have the process and power to explore at pace, to look at geometries, to optimize um, uh, structural approaches, minimize the materials that go into them. And digital fabrication is at last beginning to catch up to uh, the design capabilities that we have actually had for some time. Now, whether it is automated cutting of steel plates or, or large scale 3D printing, this is an area of significant invest, investment, which will, will no doubt um, uh, be fruitful in the time to come. And in, in, interfaces and interoperability between the various digital platforms is becoming simpler nowadays. We at AKT have invested in developing our own in-house um, systems that allow us to, to work across a broad number of platforms, allowing us the ultimate flexibility and engagement with that. And just as an example of how digital is changing thing, I wanted to, to show two um, buildings that were built not that long apart. This, this building was constructed back in 2012, obviously uh, very curvaceous in form. Um, and one of our biggest challenges in this building was how do we make it affordable with 40,000 different clad, uh, cladding panels following the, the sort of the knob surface described uh, on, on this building. We could never afford individually to make those molds, and so we went through a detailed system of rationalizing all of the panels to a set of, uh, of cylinders which approximated the, the system, spent a lot of time looking at the dislocation, viewing dis distances, so that we could compress what we would actually have to fabricate to make the building. A lot of the panels could effectively be flat. Um, but the number of cylinders that we, we had to use, we drove down, meaning that the number of doubly curved um, unique panels was actually completely minimized. But if we move that forward to a building which we have on site at present, similar in, in sort of scale and complexity, um, we find that the same problem has an entirely different solution at this point in time. 
every single panel in this building is unique and faithful to the geometry of the underlying structure. And that's because digital fabrication um, now allows us to cut from relatively cheap mold uh, materials such as clays or polystyrenes using CNC cutting or using hot wire. And that actually all of the work now draws to the drawing, the faithful drawing of the surface and a mobile can be made for a little more than, than um, a, a repetitive situation. And this digital workflow has actually enabled us to do some of the most challenging things in, in the engineering world. This project you will all recognize, I'm sure as well. I think what's interesting about this project is that its geometry is actually derived fundamentally from a parametric uh, script which worked with the, the constraints of the, the New York building to describe what the um, staircases could be and through that set the landing levels which then was unrolled into the mesh. Now our park team put together this, this image which I think is really effective in describing how our, our digital work streams enabled, you, enabled this project to become reality from that very simple start, controlling the geometry from um, a, a building code requirement. We were able to take it through the, the analysis in terms of the structural elements, plate buckling, very, very complex uh, dynamic analysis, and also to interface more globally with the BIM model and the architectural components. From this, we could extract directly to um, cutting machines with the fabricator. And that allowed the entire thing to be fabricated in the north of uh, in the north of Italy before it was stuck on a boat and transferred across the ocean and assembled at Hudson's Yard. Now I'll show you these um, these examples of offsite construction to basically explain the, the extremes that are available to us. We have at one end of the scale, we have this very simple application in housing. At the other end, we can do the most complex of, of engineering challenges. And it's fundamentally that flexibility, that adaptability that, that maximizes its use within sites which are, are, are incredibly con constrained. And that's why I've used the idea of learning environments, because in higher education campuses, we have very, very often um, several serious constraints. We have sensitivities to vibrations. We have sensitivities to nuisance in operation. We find that we have to work around timetabling and exams. Health and safety is critically important with a number of preoccupied students wandering around, staring at their, their iPhones or iPads. And the opening date for, for, for these facilities is, is very rarely flexible. Uh, it must open on time, it's as simple as that. So the first project that I was going to talk to you tonight is a neuron pod which was designed by All Design um, in the east of London for Queen Mary University. This little um, building was actually an extension to the, the original building which Will designed and which we constructed with them back in the early 2000s called the Blizzard Building. The Blizzard Building is home to Queen Mary University's um, uh, Medicine and Dentistry School. And when we started work on that project, the brief from the university was, was quite clear. They had an ambition to be in the top 10 life science um, universities in the entire world and to attract the research staff, the lecturers and the students that would allow them to do that. They needed world-class facilities. So we'll came up with this idea where conceptually we had a box of delight that hovered above all of the, scient the scientists, providing a sort of a social interaction and engagement with the wider community whilst leaving them in isolation to beaver away in the basement levels where they would be less bothered by um, external vibrations. So this is a cross section through the building and you can see that on, on the left hand side, we, we have the, the, the sort of above ground space with the box of delight, which within which the center of the cell, Queen Mary University's um, outreach program, if you like, it was the building effectively is a STEM ambassador to the community. Um, 
that allows children to come and, and experience science firsthand um, in the hope that they will be inspired and, 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 and take it up as a career. This was in the, the above ground piece. On the right hand side where you see the lecture theatre, just in front of that, all of the plant was housed so that it minimised interaction, um, uh, vibration opportunity, sorry, causing any um, distraction to the scientific experiments below. So the site was full, the lightweight structures above ground, there was really nowhere to extend the centre of the cell, which they, they needed to do because they, uh, it had been enormously successful. The neuron pod would allow them to uh, have an, uh, an increase of 200,000 people a year. So the only place that this could possibly be located was basically on the roof of the scientists. Now, clearly we would not be able to go in and put in new foundations, put in new structure, take down any of the complex servicing that allowed the, the labs to operate. And so we were entirely constrained by where the column locations were and the retainer malls uh, to the western side of the, the basement. These three points were the starting point for everything that followed. There was a, a volume of space which um, had to be encapsulated. Using this as a, as a starting point, we executed a form finding uh, analysis um, from which we developed the structural models and optimized the design through a series of, of plate buckling analysis. We, we worked closely with the fabricator because the budget was very, was very, very tight in this. And again, this is one of the beauties of, of off-site um, manufacturing. When you interface with the supply chain, you understand their strengths and weaknesses. You can craft what your response is that will make the thing your most um, achievable. So we stripped the steel panels along the length of, of uh, the neuron pod, which meant that they were effectively flat plates, which could be simply break brake pressed and then attached to an internal ribbing structure making a complete and structurally very efficient monoclock system. The whole thing weighed only around 25 tonnes but even that was a challenge for the, the capacity of the roof of the, um, the laboratory space and so we had to carefully think during our design process how we would construct this. The pod was eventually sectioned into 13 um, elements because it was 12 metres long, 10 metres high, and about uh, eight and a half metres across. And these were assembled progressively on site. This shows the final piece of the, the, the neuron pod being lifted into site. And you can see how little site space, how little site com compound we actually needed to put this object into place. This is a picture of the interior before it was insulated and lined. Um, showing, sh showing the locations of where the fiber optic hairs, which represent the synapses of the neuron firing on the outside of the building. And this is the spectacular little light, um, item as it was finished and one of Will's last projects, unfortunately. Um, and here is the interior of this space ready to influence um, and impress and, and hopefully recruit some of the 200,000 um, bright-minded young things who will pass through its doorway. Uh, at the other end of, or the western end of um, London, we had a quite different challenge posed to us in this building, which is for um, the London School of Economics. The site is again incredibly restricted um, and is surrounded on, on the eastern side by buildings which come right up against the side of the building and on the western side by a series of very small uh, lanes which were constantly in use, fulfilling the functions of all of the rest of the op operational needs of the university campus. In front of the buildings, which are identified here with a, a C, E and S, these, these are the existing buildings which would be knocked down to, to make way for, for the new facility. There was a, a lane called Houghton Street, which had become the de facto heart of the campus. It wasn't really an appropriate place. It didn't have the width, it didn't really have the scale, but it had become the heart of social interaction for the students because there was no, nowhere else. And so when the LSE decided to run a competition 
um, RSHP submitting this as their entry and we supported them on it. They decided to go as tall as they possibly could um, and, and in, interface with ground plane through taking the ground plane down and into the basement where they would locate the biggest auditorium space in the campus underneath what would become a new civic square and giving a focal point to the university, something that they really, really needed. And this was a masterstroke and was one of the, the, the most influential components in securing the, the victory for um, RSHP. The building itself is effectively two wings which are, are dislocated and slightly separated around a, a central atrium space. It runs to 14 storeys um, high at, at its highest point and is a pretty big lump. But you can see from this plan that when we constructed it, we occupied every single square millimetre available to us with this building. Every, every millimetre was precious. And to make it possible, um, we need a lot of space underground. This is our BIM model, which will demonstrate just how much construction there is under, underground that allows the, the building to have its full functionality. When we're using off-site construction, this is not necessarily a bad thing. In fact, it's probably something that will give us a great deal of balance in the programme because it will allow us to focus on the design, procurement, the final contraction design elements of it, uh, ensuring that the structure arrives on site at the point in time that we can completely minimise the, the programme. The structural frame itself is actually pretty simple. It was some off-the-shelf precast hollow core planks and a fabricated steel system, which allowed us to completely compress the structural system as much as we possibly could, given the maximum floor to ceiling and also access to the thermal mass within the soffit of, of the building. This was a fairly agricultural approach in a lot of ways, and it was relatively simple to construct. The cores went up whilst the basement was, was under construction, um, quickly followed by the steel frame that had been manufactured before the precast planks were delivered to sign. So, in spite of the fact that the materials used were, were in, in some ways quite utilitarian, the precast banks and, and, and a fairly simple um, steel frame, the, the beauty of this building comes about through its very intricate detailing. And this was something that was able to be completely controlled at point of procurement onwards with the BIM model that we developed, ensuring that the contractor fabricator were completely informed of what their expe expectation would be from beginning to end, and making sure that all of the detailing was faith faithfully reproduced in the building. The facade was of course manufactured also within a, a factory environment. And these are some photographs of, of the final structure. Internally, the, pre the spaces are incredibly flexible. All of the um, servicing was detailed in such a way that it could be fundamentally um, manufactured off-site and, and simply assembled when it arrived. There's a great deal of flexibility, wonderful airy spaces, and the central um, cascading Spanish staircase is, is a social heart in a lot of ways for this, this building. Um, for the Art University in Bournemouth, we had a problem that was of a, a slightly different scale. Um, the university was succeeding, but it needed to increase its opportunity to attract more, more students or accommodate more student numbers, but its campus was absolutely filled. There was very little space to, to do anything within um, its existing property limits. Here's the outline of the site. You can see it is framed by a series of, of trees that nobody wanted to cut down. And so Crab um, architects used this as an opportunity to, to use it as a place where the building could effectively hunker down, surrounded by the trees, enjoying the green environment and looking northwards as, as it was a, a, an artist's drawing studio maximizing its aspects or its capability to capture the north facing lights. This is a, a plan of the building on, on site. You can see just how tightly it was hemmed in, meaning that 
the, the approach to building this thing had to be very carefully considered. The process was similar to that described in the neuron pod, except that the complexity here was much higher. The, um, the contractor CIG was uh, able to deal with doubly curved um, steel panels, as was the budget. And so we, we analyzed this thing to suit their capabilities, optimizing the structure and sculpting the geometry to make sure that there could be even light flow distributed across the floor of the drawing studio. The thing was panelized in such a way that we would know that it could be lifted in, minimizing the amount of site welding that had to be put on site. And the whole thing was erected in, in, in a matter of days, really. This is a picture from the inside of the building, which spans clear 16 meters across from side to side and is constructed almost entirely of, of just eight millimeter steel plates. Picture of the finished thing and, and the wonderful spaces that it creates for people to draw in. The building was exceptionally successful, um, and as a consequence of that, they asked us to have a look at another let's call it a found space, they found a little scrap of land, an old service yard that at some point in the past they had extended into with a couple of, of porter cabins. This time the, the, the use was for an innovation studio where they could um, embrace startup companies that, that left the university. As you can see from this site plan, it was again hemmed in. We had a um, steeply sloping site on one side, the porter cabins were there and every conceivable service um, known to man was included on the site. But the materiali materiality that uh, was chosen for this building was entirely different to that of the drawing studio. Here, CLT, uh, a, a completely cleaner material, was used to, to sculpt a, a space and an environment that aimed to break down the notion of studio, workshop and office and create some really dramatic spaces inside. They were pre-assembled into um, cones that could be lifted into place and, and, and give each other reciprocal support. The digital technologies that allowed us to um, produce the designs for this building um, were, were absolutely essential. It would be nigh on impossible to do this without the capabilities that we have developed in-house over the years. The orange um, sections on this are walls, which are of course not vertical. This is a building that is difficult to understand and plan, difficult to understand in section, and very difficult to, to design in a, in a, a, um, a material that's non-homogeneous. CLT timber is, has different properties in different directions and, and by its nature has to include a whole bunch of um, jointing arrangements. So we had to invent a whole new mechanism for being able to describe the geometry of the, the panelization to make sure that it could come together, that it could offer each other reciprocal support and to communicate through the digital environment all of the forces that each of the connections would have to be designed and assembled for. It was really um, quite a unique challenge for us in, in a wonderful material that we should be building more and more with in um, these educational environments. These are some of the renders that CRAB put together um, as part of its planning application. And unfortunately at the moment we haven't quite managed to get this one built but we're keeping our fingers crossed that it will be something we're able to walk through in the not too distant future. The final project that I thought I would talk to you about today is the townhouse in Kingston University. This was um, designed by Grafton Ar Architects, who have recently, as I'm sure you will all know, won the Pritzker Prize. Um, it is quite an extraordinary building, um, and those of you who are familiar with Grafton's Architects will, will, will understand um, why it achieved quite so highly. As always, the site was complicated. We have um, uh, a collection of trees surrounding us and the footprint of the existing um, temporary porter cabin buildings was much smaller than that what would be required in the replacement building so all access around this building was tightening up meaning that 
the opportunities that would be afforded through um, off-site were, were immediately apparent. But really, the, 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 the direction for using off-site construction came from, from the brief. We went to the original briefing um, session. We left there, went for a cup of coffee, and, and Shelley said to me, well, we've got a massive diversity in the spaces that we have to provide in there. The courtyard has got these 15 metre spans. Would it not be absolutely wonderful if we could have 15 metre spans everywhere? But we can't afford that, can we, Jerry? And I said, well, actually, if you think about some of the most utilitarian buildings that we build, some of the most economically efficient buildings that we build, they are car parks and they're on a 15 metre by seven and a half metre grid. So perhaps we can turn to that type of technology. And from that conversation, the buildings planning began to develop. You can see from these plans that there is an enormous degree of diversity in what the programme is. The courtyard, which is described at ground floor level, is really a big auditorium, but the auditorium had to be able to in interface with the atrium at all times, being accessible to the students so it could actually form a core le learning space when it wasn't being used for, for performances or, or large scale lectures. The idea for this, I think, was very much influenced by the fact that as we circulated around the um, university's existing library, we found students occupying every single nook and cranny of the building, working in isolation. No one was sitting at a desk. They had found their own, their own spaces, um, which was being facilitated by the fact that most of their work could be done on a laptop. There's theatres, TV studios, dance studios, dance studios which sit next door to libraries, um, rare book archives. This building actually has it all in terms of the, the, the programme. And in, in section, you begin to get some idea of the complexity. Grafton obviously work with the section of their building. It is incredibly important for them to understand how light and life and air flows through through the buildings um, and this in turn forms part of the, the ventilation strategy and the servicing strategy that we would use to keep the energy within the building exceptionally low. Um, so this collection of spaces really formed the basis for the building. It was not the fabric of the building that, 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 that dictated where the spaces went, the spaces dictated where everything else went. This is a picture of our BIM model, which represents the structural solution that, that was implemented on site. It was really quite a, a, a remarkable um, frame that was pulled together on this. The typical bays span 15 meters and double T units were used to span across this, um, this large distance. There was a precast concrete uh, colonnade, which was made out of re reconstructed stone. And it was a very deliberate move by Grafton to increase the, the interface between the town of Kingston, which was to the left hand side as we look at this building, and the university to, to move footfall across and encourage this relationship to develop between the town and its university. Um, the uh, precast double T units were supported on a number of, of boot beam elements, which were in turn supported on columns. And the whole thing, in, in all, there were 229 double T units that made up the floor structures, on top of which we attached um, uh, an activated cooling system. And as the air was passed through the floor void to minimize any of the structures dangling down from it, this was effective in, in preconditioning the air before it was distributed on the floor plates. This is some of the pictures of the building as it was being constructed on site. You can see the tab system fixed to the top flange of the, the double, double T units. In all, within this building, there were 1,900 precast components. Um, the contractor, the main contractor was Wilma Dixon, and the specialist frame contractor. Um, basically drew on four precast uh, producers to pull together the things that they were good at, open up the opportunities to uh, maximise the, the supply chain capabilities, 
he detailed what the connections would be and how those interfaces work. And this, I think, is in many ways the future for maximizing our opportunities within the offsite uh, world, mixing and matching the various strong points within the supply chain. This is the, this is the staircases within the atrium environment and as the building was beginning to approach completion. I think that it demonstrates with, with a bit of thought, um, careful use of material and the, the right mindset, you can really do some quite extraordinary, extraordinary things with off-site constructions. And this is a picture of, of the courtyard where the students are you know, inhabiting the space and using it in their own ways. So, Park Farm told us that we had to modernise and die. It's quite a negative, or, or die, is quite a negative message. I think the opportunities within um, our industry for doing something quite extraordinary at this point in time are huge. And I think we must all work to, towards embracing it and modernising and thriving. That's it from me. We can now all go and have a gin and tonic because it's 27 degrees outside. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Jerry. Um, before you head out to your garden, um, we might have a few questions, um, but I'll just start quickly um, with just kind of saying that you've focused on these um, educational projects. Um, and it's been a kind of, it's really been so great to see the kind of breadth of scale between those, those projects that you've worked on. Um, but how do you see um, offsite construction um, uh, working, like creating opportunities with other typologies? Um, and are you working, I think, else at the moment? Yeah, yeah, we are in, in many different areas. The reason that I, I picked um, learning environments and, and higher education environments in particular is that the scale of spaces that you have to respond to are in, entirely different to those that grab all of the, the airplay in the, the discussions about offsite manufacture in the world of residential. So it was really to go to the extreme end of that discussion where we have, you know, big spaces that are perhaps 20, 20 meters by 20 meters and to show that actually we can still use offside construction very effectively in these situations. We're looking at it in probably every single possible uh, sector of, of our industry at the moment. We've got some very um, interesting research that's, that's, that's happening in terms of how we will build high rise office buildings, both in concrete and steel, uh, with uh, as much prefabrication as is possible. Um, I'm going to just head to Ellis, who's going to ask a question. Hello, Jerry. Um, thank Hi, you. Alex. Yeah, that was fantastic. I just wanted to, I was, I was struck, I mean, the, the buildings you showed were all terrific, but they were also very um, bespoke solutions. And I was sort of reminded of, a, I mean, it feels like ancient history now, but um, when the whole Building Schools for the Future program yeah. was being delivered, and you, uh, yeah, people. I think certainly Lang O'Rourke were very yeah. uh, fundamental to a, um, a series of projects. I know they delivered with AHMM, uh, which were um, working with a kind of precast concrete technology in a much more uh, production line like um, uh, kind of you know, attitude. That there were, were, were kind of standard systems effectively that became possible because there was such a quantity of building um, being delivered. Um, and I just wondered what, that, yeah, has, has that gone away? Has, has, is that, that, that sort of possibility with the, are, are, are there still, um, uh, is that that possibility of working in a much more systematic way that might, uh, where solutions might be applied to multiple buildings? Is, is, is the market, yeah. is, is that, do you see any potential for that in the market at the moment? No, absolutely. I um, actually took out, I was, I was going to put some slides in about the building schools for the future programme, but I took them out, actually. Um, but 
yeah, you're absolutely right. Back, oh gosh, when was when was that? Now I, I lose track of time. But let's see. I think like the dagger that HMM did was 2012 that they finished. So yeah, it's almost a yeah. decade ago. Yeah. So we we did build a number of schools with um, Langerook as well. Yeah. Langerook at that point in time, Rio Rook was way ahead of the curve. He was a man who was completely committed to offsite construction, and there are, are some amazing examples of it that they've done relatively recently. Um, Clarges, for example, and they also did the, sh the Shell Centre. Um, it didn't succeed because actually they were so ahead of the curve that they didn't have any competition. Um, uh, and and this this is part of the problem with large large scale changes like like this. If we are going to be relying on a few massive players, then the changes are going to take place relatively slowly. Now, what I was trying to show in, in this is that you don't necessarily need to wait for that to take advantage of it. If you have the capabilities to design and draw on what is available, available to us and use that in a way that can be assembled, work with a, 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 a contractor or a, a design um, that, that will enable the, the maximum opportunity and flexibility to be taken out of that, that actually we can do quite extraordinary things. And it becomes a lot less limiting because with with you know companies who have invested millions to develop a system, they don't want to move from that anymore. It's going to stick and stick and stick. And that isn't what we need right now. What we need is this whole host of small changes and good ideas flowing through and constantly influencing each other because the, the, the task that's ahead of us in terms of responding to climate change is enormous. We need a fundamental shift in how we design and how we build. Thank you. Um, we've just got a quick question from Emily. I'm going to unmute you now. Thanks. And um, that was a really interesting talk. Thank you for taking us through that. It was like, a super quick question. Um, just at the beginning, you showed um, a really interesting kind of uh, project plan for the net zero aims for 2050. Yes. Um, I just missed the name of it. I was just wondering if you could repeat it. Uh, um, it's called Absolute Zero. And it was written by um, uh, a task force called UK Fires, F-I-R-E-S. Um, and yes, you should definitely read it. 